Good morning, afternoon, or good evening, folks. I'm your host and guide, Chris Roberts. I'm going to take you on a tour of the underground to help you prepare for what's really out there. Whether you're on the front lines battling the latest threats or leading the overall defensive strategy within your organization, my focus is to help you uncover the best ways, means, and methods to effectively and efficiently use actual threat intelligence within your company, providing you with more insights and practical ways to identify threats and reduce risks before they become incidents. Ready to dive in? Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody that's listening in and watching. Welcome to the doctor's hours. This is a, a slightly more, let's say a mellow way of doing things, but this is going to be just taking the questions. We we're very fortunate with the folks that are listening in and watching that we get questions from them. And Danny and I are going to go through a number of the questions. We're going to see if we can answer some of them and hopefully help some folks along the way. So. That's the idea. Danny is controlling the spreadsheet of questions that we have, and we're going to work our way through them. <laughs> uh, I like to control things. Sometimes this is special. You do <laughs> have the controls. I do want to point out, you have the stop, start, and edit buttons at your discretion. All hell could break loose at any point in time. Oh, that's hilarious. How are you feeling, Chris? It's rough at the moment. I mean, let's, you know, let's just no, no bones about it. It's rough. I mean, there is, there's unfortunately, there's always conflict in this world, but at the moment it's, you know, it's on the doorstep, no two ways about it. And, it, and it's on the doorstep in a very, a very overt way. And unfortunately it's in a way where it's really hard for a lot of us that are like former dot mill that want to pick up a weapon and go charging across the horizon, which would be great for about the first 30 seconds. And then quite honestly, we'd probably get in the bloody way because we're too old and too befuddled these days. So, you know, there's a lot of frustration, but there's also a crazy amount of camaraderie now for those of us that are behind the keyboard to do a lot to, to help, you know, to help the people, not just in Ukraine, but also help the people in Russia, to be honest as well. I mean, there's a lot of folks over there who don't necessarily agree with the way that the the leadership is taking the country. So yeah, it's rough. It's, there's a lot going on. There's, you know, there's been some really heavy conversations and, and actions that have occurred mm -hmm. at our behest. There's a lot of targeting going on. There's a lot of humane, non-humane conversations going on. We've lost people that many of us know, and, you know, just spend the last week doing scenarios, you know, the, what if cases, you know, what if something happens on these soils? What do we do? How do we act? And are we prepared? So yeah, it's, it's, it's rough, but you know, it is what it is. It's, it sucks that this is where we are at from a societal standpoint. And it's really terrible that any country, especially a superpower country has decided to take it upon itself to, to do what it did. Yeah. How do you. You know, it's, it's a hard time for, for many of us. How do you propose those listening in on the call, you know, remain resilient in these times? Like, what do you do to kind of keep things at a level head and just kind of recharge? And I know sometimes we, we run out of steam and I know it's hard. What, what's your proposition here? I think it's, it's a couple of different things. I mean, I'm fortunate. I can, I did it this evening. You know, I, I started 536 this morning and, you know, we're getting on for the witching hour now. And I took the car out earlier. I, I took one of the cars out and I'm fortunate where I live and how I'm at. I just took one of the cars up into the hills for an hour and just drove around and came back down and felt a lot. You know, I went through tunnels and a large, growly, burpy, farty, angry V8 going through a tunnel pretty much always puts a smile on your face or even just like a, a melancholy grin for 30 seconds is never a bad thing. So that helps. And I think. The other thing is as well, and it's something I, I talked about on, on various things, and we'll talk about it here as we go through the questions is how do we help each other? Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said for, for going, okay, I feel frustrated. I can't help over there as effectively as I want to. So how do I help those around with me? How do I know back to intelligence information? We know what all of our adversaries are planning. We know what our adversaries are doing. So how do I help those around me? How do I go to the coffee shop? And when I'm talking to people and grabbing a cup of tea, go, Hey, so talk to me for a second. If you don't mind, you know, you're sitting on the phone, what are you doing to protect your data? How are you looking after yourself? 
hey, you know, I was in the restaurant earlier and I'm like, so what, what are you folks doing to, to back up your systems? How are you making sure that if I, I, I take that computer either physically or digitally, that you can recover, that you can keep going, that you can pay your employees, that you'll open tomorrow. So just helping everybody around become a little bit more aware and just trying to pass on some knowledge and, and really kind of taking more people off of that bottom rung of the ladder. I think there's a lot to be said for, for being able to do that for people. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of the hope also with the doctor's hours session is to run through some of those scenarios and run, run through some of those questions that the audience is bringing you yeah. so that they're, they're armed with the right information. So do you want to dive in? Yeah, let's dive in. Let's see what we got going on. Cool. All right. So in the last few weeks, we've gotten quite a few questions coming in through, through the website. I've curated a few. I hope we have enough time to go through them because they're pretty juicy, <laughs> but let's kick it off with, yeah, let's kick it off with one. Yeah. What's that? No, I'll try to keep my question my answers. I mean, to, to, to something at least more succinct than I normally do. All right. Let's kick it off. Yeah. Okay. We covered this topic, uh, I think a few episodes ago, but let's dig in deeper. The first question is, what are your thoughts on information overload? Getting too much information can be overwhelming. What is enough Intel and what is too much? Oh, back to that needle in the haystack conversation. If I remember rightly, we had that and it became not just a needle in the haystack. It was the needle in the hay barn, wasn't it? We talk about you know, actionable intelligence. And I think, I mean, it's, we are in the era or the era of information overload, and that's not going to change. I mean, when you think about it back to the Ukraine conflict at the moment, it's war through social media. I mean, not only are we actually able to see what's going on, but then we have to look at information versus disinformation, what's truthful, what's not truthful. So. Even with the information we're presented, we have to do some analytics to understand is what we are being told and fed actual or not. So, um, when we look at the information overload, I, I think we're just on the, we're, we're on the forefront of it and it's not going to change data itself. And somebody can correct me online data itself is, is basically doubling every couple of years now. You know, I think it was like in the last two years, it's increased by like 95 or 98% or something crazy. So. The quantity and the volume of data isn't going away. What we have to do is, is turn information into intelligence by asking it more succinct questions, by having better tools and technologies to ask it better questions. And, and a lot of that's going to come through autonomy. No two ways about it. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Are we working on how to make it more effective? Absolutely. Cause we know we have to, and then it's taking that intelligence and making it actionable. You know, it's something we talked about and it's something that, you know, what there's a continue to come up as we talk to C-suites and as we talk to practitioners, I, I don't care what's going on if it's not relevant to me. So I think that's where intelligence, what's the value of intelligence to me, that value as to what's enough intelligence is if it helps me make a more informed decision, if you're telling me that a whole set of IP address should be absolutely blocked. Well, why, why do I care? Is that useful to me? Or is that just something that has to be added on the firewall or whatever? If you're telling me that, Hey, I see a number of your executives that are being targeted over here, or that physically are going to be in issues. If they go here, then that's actionable. I can do something with that. And it's the same thing. If you turn around to me and say, well, you've got code over the internet, well, who cares? But if you come to me and say, Hey, you've got a development team of which four or five of them have got open GitHub repositories. They're using their corporate email address and I can see the data. I care about that. Now I can go back to that development team and say, Hey, let me help educate you a little bit. Let me help you understand security and safety. Let me help you look at that. So it's, can I use what you are presenting to me? Cause if I can't, and I can't make a business decision and a risk decision, that ain't much use to me. Right. So, I mean, information overload, lots of data. Second question that came in, which is a nice segue. How can we be more collaborative in sharing threat intel data mm. and help small enterprises to adopt a security approach at a cost-effective manner? Yeah, that's a good one. So let, let's break that down. Collaboration's huge. 
And so the question then becomes, how do I collaborate without maybe giving my cards away? So, you know, you, you play like bridge or something that's typically you're playing with somebody else, but you're not sitting there showing your cards to everybody else all the time. It's a very, very collaborative way of playing a hand of cards to somebody. So it's the same thing with intelligence. From a fiduciary standpoint or from a legal standpoint, might not be able to put my hand up and go, hey, I got breached and I haven't told everybody yet, but I'm going to tell you about it. But what I can do is have back channels. I can have conversations. I can get onto Signal and go, hey, Danny, can't say what's going on. We got some challenges. Do me a favor, make sure you've got this locked down, this sorted out. Do me a favor, go check your Active Directory for this. And by the way, check your Intel feeds for this. That's helping you become more aware of maybe a specific incident. You put that in real life, perfect example would be, you know, if I see somebody sniff around my next door neighbor's front door or mailbox, well, I'm going to A, check on mine and keep the cameras, make sure, but I'll also let everybody else know, hey, look, there's somebody sniffing around a mailbox. I might not say to them, hey, they carried off the mail, they had this and they had this and they had all this, because that's information that's private or secure to maybe me or somebody else but I will make people aware at a situation level that's, that's safe to do so. So that's one part. I think we can collaborate without disclosing a ton of information. We can focus people and point people. I also think that there's a way to, to do a lot more with the smaller organizations. I'm seeing some really good efforts. There are definitely some good efforts where some government agencies uh, who work with small and medium businesses are reaching out and saying, Hey, we've got resources for you. Use them. We want to help you. We want to educate you. We want to help you understand the questions to us. We want to help you understand where is your data? Who has access to it? Where are your assets? It's that know thyself. And I think what we could all do, every single one of us can do is take that step back and start asking those what if questions. Start asking, hey, if that computer goes, or if that data set to goes, or if that data gets out, or if that information is available, and you can start asking those yourself. That doesn't cost money. It doesn't cost a darn thing. It takes a lunchtime and a couple of like-minded people to sit down and really have conversations. And mm -hmm. truthfully, some of the larger enterprises could probably be leading some of those efforts rather than coming down draconian on their supply chain, coming down and saying, Hey, look, we've got a series of things for you to think about. Even if you take, uh, like the NIST cybersecurity framework, not even the whole heavyweight, even just the CSF, breaking that into plain, simple language and helping companies just understand simple stuff, education, passwords, backups, antivirus, patching, physical controls, software, firmware, just some simple things that companies of any size and scale can do to help themselves. I think we could do a lot more there. It kind of reminds me of the last, uh, I think we had a session with Joseph Carson, where he talks about people first approach, not technology first approach. It's about that collaboration It's about talking to your people and empowering them to your point to, to ask right questions or to learn to ask the right questions and to understand how to translate a lot of that tech into just regular communication and information so that they're more effective. Yeah, I 100% with you. And I, and I think you just hit it as well, which is it's almost a translation effect. I don't yeah. want to go to all my supply chain and say, hey, you got to fill out the 800-53. I mean, it, there's just no time to do it. But hey, look, I've got 10 things, I just 10 things I want you to look at, or five things. Do me a favor, take a look at them. I've given you some examples, I've given you some easy way to do them. Help you to help yourself, to help me and all those, you know, it's reciprocity at that point. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're right. You break it down, we make it simpler and easier to digest for everybody. All right. Another great segue to... What is the next awesome question from an anonymous guest, actually? Um, actually, everyone is anonymous. I'm not call them, calling them out this time unless they allow me to. <laughs> it's your fault. We blame I you. Know. Yeah. All right. This person actually is looking to leverage dark, dark web threat intelligence. This person is asking, what should be the roadmap for that? How should Oops. I go about that? Oh, I like that one. That's a really, really nice one because that kind of... It's interesting. We've run into this with other technologies. It's 
when's the right time to buy it or when's the right time to acquire it or go do dealings with it. And there's a terrible, terrible answer, which is the right time, unfortunately, is always now, or it should have been yesterday, depending on how bad the situation is. To me, information and intelligence has got to be pretty high up on the list of acquisitions because it helps you shape the future path of where your security roadmap needs to be. It helps you understand where the risks are. You know, if, if you're charging off, let's just say you've built the next greatest widget and the widget's sitting here and it's an amazing widget. And you've surrounded that widget with say 50, 50 staff employees, people, whatever you want to call them. And that widget and your staff are all sitting in a building. Well, automatically you're suddenly going, well, I need to protect the widget. But you maybe forgot about the people. How do I educate the people to protect the widget? You forgot that the building is in the middle of, you know, a war zone. Well, how do I protect that? And so all of a sudden, if you build intelligence in, it helps you make that more informed decision. It'll help you understand an adversary's perspective. It'll help you maybe contextualize, hey, there are 10 other widget companies out there. And this is what they've done to become more effective. So I think that's a big part of it is you almost want intelligence very early in your roadmap, very early, and you don't have to go out and buy the Rolls Royce, simple stuff, Google the darn thing, you know, you've got simple stuff out there. There's a lot of open source stuff. There's Multigo, there's Paterva. There's a lot of good, simple stuff out there that helps you just understand where you're at. When you're ready for it, that's when the industry itself comes into play. Yes, you know what? We're talking from one of those organizations, but part of the logic is answer all the questions. You know, basically, we'll give you the questions to us. That's part of the reason we're doing this. And really, the whole idea is take a look at all the stuff we're doing and go, okay, now I'm going to ask every single one of these darn vendors, how do you take this massive swamp of data? turn into intelligence and give me something I can use effectively. Is the goal, and this is the next question, I love these, this, these talking points is exactly in the right order too. So is the goal of using threat intelligence to become more proactive versus reactive? Take me through the difference between the two. Yeah, it's, and it's tough because again, you got, so the proactive reactive is, is very I say it's black and white, but it's very, it's one or the other. To me, it's more of a maturity thing. And if you take a maturity level of zero, you have no clue what's going to happen to you, even when it hits you, unfortunately, you know, you're just not aware. This is where, you know, the statistics that we hear about how long uh, a threat has been inside an organization. And unfortunately there's some crazy numbers. I mean, there's, there's, com there's companies that have been breached for years and don't know about it. That's when you look at a maturity of zero, and then you go to the other end of the scale, which is companies that are like leading the charge. And, you know, they know as soon as something even tries to contemplate hitting their environment, that whole proactive reactive sits in the middle of there. For me, reactive is you're always on the back foot. You're always, you know, an incident occurs, you send a team out, another incident occurs, you send a team out, something happens, you investigate, blah, 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 but you're always on that back foot. And the problem is, is with that is every single time one of these situations occur, you have to do the forensics and you have to do the instant response and you have to try to get to root cause as quickly and effectively as possible. And all the other things that go with like a full incident response handling. Whereas if you look at a more proactive standpoint and you start putting your habit above the parapet and you go, Hey, what could potentially affect me? Is it geopolitical? Is it, uh, users? Is it disgruntled previous employees? Is it competitive? Is it different countries? Is it simply the fact that people keep reusing their darn passwords and we've just found half the stuff's, you know, flipping Game Boy passwords on the internet that by the way, they match their corporate passwords. Ah, you know, it's things like that then unless you're out there looking at it, you won't see it until it hits you. And, and at least if you find that information, you can react to it in your own speed. You have the ability to go, oh, we found passwords. Well, let's go talk to the individuals. Hey, was, oh yeah, you've used that before. Great. Now let's change the darn thing. 
Are you reacting to a situation? Absolutely. But you're doing it kind of like outside of your, outside of your environment, your, your sphere of influence. So to some degree, now you are getting more proactive because you're going out there asking the questions as to what could hit me versus just waiting for someone to smack you between the eyes. I think we covered that. What was it? Six months ago, we did a threat hunting versus adversary hunting webinar on threat posts. Yeah. Uh, we'll that was a that, fun one. Yeah, that was, that's yeah. fun. I mean, that's, and it's, it's really interesting because again, you come out to that maturity conversation and part of it's maturity, but part of it is also philosophy. You know, are you as an organization happy building up your defensive architecture sufficiently just to hunker down? That's how a lot of companies are. Or are you willing to literally say, Hey, here is my comfort zone. We need to step out of it. We actually need to become more proactive. You know, everybody is still working from home. Yes, there are companies that are bringing people back in, but that attack surface has expanded. So if you've been sitting there hunkered down, you might not have thought about the fact that all the devices in the home become an attack surface. You might not have realized that, you know, half your employees during lockdown didn't want to keep cooking food every day. So they went out and bought a blasted microwave that's IOT enabled, or they bought a hot pot that they can control from their work computer, thereby opening all sorts of, so if you realize this, you can get ahead of it and you can educate the people. You can say, Hey, love the fact you're doing it. Absolutely amazing. Here's how to do it safely. Here's how to do it securely. Or you end up reacting to the down thing because now you find the hot pot's got direct connection to outer Mongolia and New Zealand, and let's just send you corporate secrets over there. Love it. All right. Last question for today. Yeah. I like that these are short and sweet to the point. All right. This is a loaded question, so bear with me as I take a <laughs> breath in. All right. This was actually a, a recent question we got in through through the website. Where do you draw the line when it comes to security applications you may need for your environment versus employing good security practices? What I mean is the barrage of salespeople trying to sell you the latest and greatest is borderline maddening. And it seems like there's always one more tool to quote unquote protect or one more application to get quote unquote full visibility. I don't want to be a bank here handing out tons of money, but at the same time, I don't want not to do anything at all. If you could give some insight or ideas on what to do in this type of situation, that would be great. Oh, I like this one. Cause this is that whole people process and technology thing. This is, I like this. This is, and, and it's tough. Oh, is this a tough one? Because everybody's selling you the tool and technology that's going to fix all of your problems. And nobody ever stands up and goes, yeah, we've only got it half covered or any of that kind of good stuff. So first and foremost, let's, let's start with the easy one. Let's, before we go anywhere, anywhere near technology, the first thing you got to do is we tell, let's talk about situational awareness. And we've talked about this a few times, but we'll rerun it. So if you don't know yourself and your environment, and we're talking the physical environment. We're talking the assets, the locations, the people, all these other things. If you don't know those effectively enough, then you're not going to know what to do, how to deal with it, or how to protect it, or how to reduce the risks on it. So for me, first and foremost, it's something that helps you understand what you have. You know, and that's from the asset standpoint, the physical assets, and now we can talk about the digital assets as well. So. What have you got? Where is it? What's on it? Who's accessing it? And what the hell are they doing with it? You know, those are some very, very simple ones. And like, they're really simple. And again, you don't necessarily need a huge amount of technology with that. I mean, you can just use human pad to be perfectly honest. But for me, I think that's probably the, that's probably like number one, know thyself. Now you've got that, then you can start taking a step back and go, okay. From a business perspective, what do we care about? Are we caring about, you know, the corporate secrets? Are we caring about the humans? Are we caring about manufacturing supply chain? Are we in retail and we have to care about, you know, credit cards and everything else? So once you've actually figured out what you care about, is it data? Is it, you know, is it physical assets? Now you can start to wrap some controls around those. 
And those are both physical controls. So now we've got people on process and then technology at the end of it. You know, perfect example, you've got a machine shop that's running 24 by seven, that's pumping out widgets. And if that machine shop goes down, it costs you half a million an hour. Well, you're going to want to put some protection around that. You're going to want to make sure that maybe there's separation, segmentation, and some monitoring. You're going to want to make sure that suppliers and everybody else come in through a VPN and authenticate. So now you've got two-factor authentication, you've got monitoring in place, and you've got a consolidated framework for identification and user controls and access controls. Great. That's sorted that out quite nicely and quite easily. Now you're also going to unlock the stuff. So you're going to log it. You want to maintain those logs for 12 months, at least 13 would be nice. And so those are some simple things. Now take a step back and go, Hey, we're a retail client. Well, now you play the game of follow the credit card. You know what assets you have, you know, where they are, who's got them or so on. So now you play the follow the credit card. Now, you know, each point along there, you've got to encrypt it. You've got to manage it. You've got to control it. You've got to identify it. You got to log it, you got to monitor it. You got to basically do the fiduciary steps necessary for say PCI or, or anything else. So it's, it's again, it's knowing your environment and knowing what you've got to be adhering to from a business perspective. You know, if you're doing business over in Europe, now you've got GDPR to, to be concerned by. So how do I make sure that my data is sanitized or protected effectively or managed effectively? If it's up on the cloud, now you've got concerns and considerations around there. Am I putting a terrestrial monitoring system in place that can also monitor the cloud environments? The, I mean, the biggest thing I think for so many of us, it's, it's that visibility. Again, not only what do I have, but also what the heck is going on with it? Now that's technology, but you gotta have the people. Or you got to have the MSP, MSSP to look after it or a combination of both. So, you know, we always talk about what do we need when it comes to security? Well, we need the bodies. So how do we bring the bodies in? How do we bring in apprentices? How do we bring in juniors and train them? How do we bring people in and make them as effective as we possibly can? What's the training? What's the awareness? What's the education program? So I think that's a big part of it as well. The flip side, and it's something I think you and I should sit down and do, I, something I thought about doing on LinkedIn, and I was actually talking to somebody else about this as well, is I think we need to have a set of 10 questions to ask vendors. So exactly to this question, which is, hey, if, if you have a firewall or, or an endpoint, if you've got an endpoint vendor coming up to you, what are those 10 things that you need to ask that endpoint vendor to be happy? that they understand what machine learning is or artificial intelligence, because they're all going to tell you they do it. So actually you need to be armed with an understanding or at least know how to tell BS from reality when that question's answered. If they're coming to sell you something to do with a, you know, a VPN technology or some doing networking technology, what are the 10 questions to ask them? If they're selling you mobile device management technology, what are the 10 questions we need to ask them? So I think that's the other part of it as well, is when do you draw the line? You draw the line when you know your assets, you know your visibility, and you now understand risk. And you can go to the business and say, dear business, what are you, what are you, what are you okay with? Yeah. Where is your acceptable level of risk? How do you calculate it? And there's a whole bunch of conversations to have around there. But that's a conversation with legal, with compliance, with HR, and with the CEO. I'm going, hey. I got visibility. I know what we got. I know where it is. I know what's happening with it and we're watching it. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, now we're going to have a conversation about what do we do? Now we have a conversation about incident response. Now we have a conversation about whether we want to own it or give it to an MSP, MSSP. And so all of those conversations come into play, you know, an acceptable risk for some organizations might be, Hey, we have to have every new shiny freaking toy under the sun. And others might be like, Hey, uh, you know, we got an untangle box in the corner and uh, we've got, you know, we got cyber six skills as Intel onto it and we've got it running AV heuristics and everything else. And yeah, Hey, we're in good shape. We're, we're actually happy with that, that we're risk enough with, and that's a hell of a lot cheaper and probably more effective than most of the other stuff out there. It's fabulous. Awesome. I think we're wrapping up on time here, but I do want to open up the session for you 
if there's anything you want to impart on the audience today before we sign off, I always like to kind of pick your brain here. Something special you want to say, given given uh, the time or, or anything that's so, burning inside. I think you said it, which is people process then technology. And, and I think that's crucial in any of these conversations and in any of these questions we've gone through. Yes, we're very, very fortunate. We've got cyber six skill here and they're happy to hang out and let us do this. But what I love about it is it's not, we're not saying they're going, oh, you have to do this and you have to do this and here's how you do it. I love the simple fact is we can sit there and go, Hey, there's nine went to say, get your people sorted out first, get your processes in place for goodness sakes, get those together. And then when all that is done, let's have a tech conversation. And, and, and that that's you and, it, and it's a tough thing and it, it's really tough, especially for those of us in security. Cause I'll be honest, I'm, I'm one of those people that, that wants to out engineer the human. I, I really, I, I mean, I do don't, don't get me wrong. I have a love hate on one hand. I want to cuddle and coddle and, and look, but on the other hand, I want to strangle the living daylights out of them. But, and, and, and it's tough because if you look at technology with technology, I can get to a point where I can out engineer a human's ability to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. There is an argument to say that planes are safer without pilots and autonomous plane is set. None of us on this planet, I would imagine are likely to get into an autonomous civil aviation plane, not just yet. Yet the same thing is with technology. Can I engineer a piece of technology that can sit on your computer and do a much better job of you than you of looking after passwords and looking after your identity and looking after your controls and looking after your browser and everything? Absolutely. I would, I would put some money on that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But do we really want to take control away from the human and basically have us sitting in the corner and not doing very much? I don't think so. I think we still have a place whether I like it or not. So we can't ignore the human. We can't downplay the role of the human. We have to be, we have to do a better job. We also have to accept the fact that humans are humans. We all make freaking mistakes. We are all going to click something. We are all going to give something away that we shouldn't do. We're all going to post pictures or images. We, we make mistakes. We're humans. So security has to be aware of that. And we have to understand that that happens. And how do we compensate for it? How do we build it into our equation? That I think is yeah. the crucial. I'm like, we need to put this up on a plaque. Such beautiful quotes from the Chris Roberts. <laughs> All right. This has been awesome. Our first ever true yeah. form doctors hours. And I do want to say to the audience that if you have any questions, feedback, or want to vent happily, please do so on our website, cybersixskill.com forward slash podcast. We have a nice little menu item up on the top there called Ask Dr. Dark Web Anything. You could just plop in there and, and, and ask, ask him anything. And so, it can be anything. And it actually can be. I don't care if you ask about the darn dogs. I mean, there are three great names here that would absolutely appreciate the odd question or two. I was going to throw that one in there for a second. Be careful, be careful. I, uh, I may <laughs> likely take that up. Awesome. These mutts in the back are, uh, Aww. all right. This has been awesome. Chris, thank you. No, well, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Dr. Dark Web. This show is brought to you by Cyber Six Girl, the threat intelligence company. If you would like to learn more, please feel free to follow or subscribe to Dr. Dark Web on your favorite podcast streamer. Or as an alternative, you can always find us online at cybersixgirl.com slash podcast. You'll find all the latest episodes, goodies, nuggets of information, background, and probably some stickers or two. See you in the dark.